For our second scripture reading today, we read from the part of the Apostles' letter to the early Christians living in the house church in Corinth, Greece. The crossroads city of Corinth was a wild city in the first century. And in reaction, some people believed in complete celibacy and even in marriage. Here's Paul's response. We read from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the matters you wrote, it is well for a man not to touch a woman. But because of cases of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a set time to devote yourselves to prayer. And then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is why I say by concession, not of commandment. I wish you were all as I am myself. But each has his particular gift from God, one having one kind and another a different kind. Here ends the reading. Let us truly hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and let our hearts be open to all these words. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, out of all the words which are spoken this day, out of all the words which are sung, out of all the words which are heard, may it be your living word that sticks with us and leads us to deeper life with you. In the name of the risen Christ we pray. Amen. It was the Minnesota State Fair. When I was growing up, we always made the two-hour drive from our home in southern Minnesota to spend the whole day walking through the exhibits, riding umpteen rides on the midway. Man, I love that. Catching glimpses, catching maybe just glimpses of famous politicians and going to the evening grandstand show. And one year, when I was, I suppose, in about fifth or sixth grade, headlining the grandstand show was one of the greatest Motown groups ever. Diana Ross and the Supremes. You know, stop in the name of love before you break my heart. Now, I had seen Diana Ross on television, but I'd never seen her in person. And I was in love. What great music. What a great performer. And how beautiful she was. All I knew was that such beauty was good. I grew up in a traditional home. There were six of us kids who grew up on a working farm near Blue Earth, Minnesota. From my older brother Paul to two younger brothers and two younger sisters. Mom and Dad worked hard to make a life and to launch us six kids. Not an easy feat. And I remember how many times when Dad would come in from a long day of work out in the fields or with the livestock for supper, and he would wash up and find Mom who had just put in just as long of a day as he had, And they would embrace for a satisfying kiss. Not just a little peck, but a real kiss. And mom would get a little embarrassed and we kids would giggle a little bit. But we knew that it was good. Today we continue our sermon series on sex and faith. And we are looking together today at making choices as teens, as adults of any age, as parents of children, preteens and teenagers, and as perhaps grandparents of, of them with what influence we might have. And the first message I want to give to you is 
that the body is not something to be ashamed of. Romantic expression is not something to be ashamed of. Our second scripture reading from 1 Corinthians is addressed to early, early Christians in the great city of Corinth in Greece, which was such a crossroads that it was known far and wide as a wild, wild city. Kind of like Las Vegas' motto today, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Have you heard that? Now, because that ethic can become destructive to individuals and couples and families, some people in Corinth went to the extreme. They believed in celibacy even within marriage. But the Apostle Paul argues against this extreme position. In fact, there is a whole book of the Bible The Song of Solomon, sometimes known as the Song of Songs, devoted to the celebration of romantic bodily love. The body is not something to be ashamed of. Romantic expression is not something to be ashamed of. Second, as we make choices and seek to help our kids make good choices, it's good to... Be able to talk openly when kids ask questions. When my wife Kay and I were expecting our second child, her two and a half year old big brother Colin, of course, wanted to know why mommy's tummy was getting so big. And we answered all the questions that he had without overwhelming him. I mean, he was two and a half years old. We told him that in a few weeks, the baby would come out of mommy's tummy. So, when the night came for me to take Kay to the hospital to deliver, Kay put Colin on her lap and said, Mommy's going to have a baby now. And Colin jumped off her lap like the baby was coming right then and there. (laughs) But it is good to talk openly, to cultivate an atmosphere where you can talk openly and without embarrassment. One of my high school math teachers was Hal Schrader, Mr. Schrader, a fine teacher and the high school tennis coach who took his team to the state tournament each and every year and even won the state championship over Edina one year. Well, Mr. Schrader's wife was an RN. She was a registered nurse and she taught a sex ed class for all the area churches. These were the years before sex ed was taught in the schools. Mrs. Schrader was very straightforward about all the body parts and, and physicality of, of sexual pleasure and reproduction. And she was very caring in helping us think about boundaries and limits. She taught us not to be afraid to talk about sex. And she taught us that sexuality is far more than just sex, far more than just any physical act. It includes all of what we are as body, mind, and spirit together. I'm thankful that I learned to value the body and soul together when learning about sex and sexuality from Mrs. Schrader. And I'm thankful for the life-giving relationship we saw that she and her husband had. And to not be afraid of talking about sex. Third, as we make choices and help our preteens and teens make choices, remember that we are loved for who we are, of whatever body type we are. There is so often an idolization of the Barbie bottled body type in our culture and in the media. I'm pierced to the heart when I think that that's the way our young girls and our teenage girls sometimes think that that's the way they have to look. This body image is but one of many, many, many ways that God has created us. Give yourself or the young girls or the teenage girls in your life 
a gift. Give them a gift. Teach them their own version of the powerful baptism words that Jesus heard from heaven when he was baptized in the Jordan River. Teach them to look in the mirror every day and say, You are my daughter, my beloved. With you I am well pleased. God loves us for who we are and not for conforming to a Barbie body image. Fourth, and this is specific to talking about teens about sex, emphasize the process of building relationship rather than confrontation. I think that Dr. Kara Powell, professor of youth ministry, and Jim Hancock, longtime youth minister, talk about this very helpfully. They make the point that teenagers, quote, marinate in sex 24-7, literally, through their hormones, as well as in the media and in their subculture. So look for opportunities to talk. Begin with conversations that happen to pop up. A provocative scene on television or a story having to do with sex on the news. And make a comment or ask a question that invites conversation. Maybe sometimes it'll go somewhere and other times it won't. And listen, don't lecture. We parents have anxiety about sexuality. So we might be prone to lecture but everyone wants to be listened to. Your teen, you, me. Listen, don't lecture. And ask questions to help them do the talking. It's about building relationship after all. Emphasize the process of building that relationship, not confrontation. You will have the chance to share your values. All right, fifth today. As human beings, we are strong, but we are vulnerable. I speak as a dad here, as a father, as well as a pastor. When we were raising our teenagers, Colin and Caitlin, they are now 30 and 28 years old, respectively. What I wanted for them in their sexuality was for them not to be ashamed of being sexual beings. I wanted for them to find joy in their relationships. But, and this is a big one for us parents, also for them to be safe. For them not to be abused or belittled. For them to know possible and real consequences. For them to know that abstinence can be a very healthy choice. And for them to respect others in all these ways. And I wanted them to weave all of this into growing, into all that it means to be a thinking, feeling, choosing, praying child of God. The statistics are that, depending on where you read, that 41 to 47 percent of High school students are active sexually. And so it is important to stay safe from abusive situations and from sexually transmitted diseases and unwanted pregnancy. And it is important to stay informed, well informed, and to be able to talk to trusted adults. May we be such a community of trust. I don't know what I'd do without a woman named Joan in the church where our kids did most of their growing up because our kids always had Joan to go talk to about stuff when they didn't feel that they could talk to mom and dad. May we be such a community of trust as the church of Jesus Christ. God loves each of us so much in whatever situation we find ourselves. And we are called to be that kind of people of love as well. I want to close on a, with a reflection on the great commandments according to Jesus. 
as we think about our sexuality at any age. Now, Jesus was anything but a scold when it came to sex. He was about healing. He was about forgiveness. He was about helping people grow into all they could be as daughters of God, sons of God. One time the religious authorities were grilling Jesus, hoping to trap Him. And one of them, a lawyer we read, asked Him a question to test Him. Teacher, what commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to Him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. First of all, to love your neighbor as yourself means to love yourself. If you are in an abusive situation, get help. Love yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus says. When it comes to sexual expression of whatever kind, at whatever age, whether it is just holding hands, or just a quick touch or kiss, or more, let us ask ourselves, does this involve kindness, affection, respect, understanding, and joy, as well as desire? Does this nourish us as well as nourishing the other person in body, mind, and spirit? Is it part of perhaps leading us into a deeply loving, committed relationship? Does it help us love the other person as we would be loved? Does it help us and the other person to love God more? God, the lover of our souls, as Charles Wesley, that great hymn writer, once put it. I'm talking about all these things, whether we're gay or straight, whether we're transgendered or asexual, because I believe that God creates us in many ways. Intimacy comes in many forms. I'm thankful for the nourishment that I have received for 36 years being married to my wife Kay in body, mind, and spirit. And in the last two months of her rehab, after her December 21st stroke, we've started a new routine from her therapist. And I have her permission to share this with you. Her occupational therapist... And, and we do this every night in the warmest place in the church, with, or in the church, at home. <laughs> the warmest place at home, which is often the, the bathroom, and uh, on these cool spring nights. And the occupational therapist taught me to put my right hand on her scapula, on her shoulder blade, and my left hand just underneath the, the shoulder joint in front, and then to squeeze in a certain way and hold that for 20 seconds and release and hold that for 30, 20 seconds and release and hold that for 20 seconds and then release. And then... I do something that her healing touch practitioner showed me. I place my hand right underneath her collarbone for 30 seconds, just gently, and it always elicits quiet sobs from her, from what she's gone through and what she's going through. It is such a time together. And then, finally, I place my hands, my two hands above her right ear, gently, at about the 11 o'clock position, just in loving touch, gentle touch. And I have to say that these last few months have been really tough, although she's made wonderful progress 
And she still is making progress with her left hand, which as a pianist and organist is crucial. But it's been tough. But sharing this shoulder stretch and this healing touch has been some of the best time in our marriage. Give thought to the way in which you share intimacy with your beloved and how you share your love with your family members and and with your friends. God is good all the time. Amen and amen.